We're going to be in Exodus chapter 20, as today we conclude our series in the Ten Commandments. We've been studying through the Ten Commandments now for two and a half months, ten weeks, and uh, I personally think it's been a tremendous time together. My name's Cody. I'm the pastor here at Redemption. It's amazing to be able to share God's Word with you, and I, I count it as such an honor and a privilege to serve you in this way as we jump into uh, our, our final study here in the Ten Commandments. Um, I was uh, back in, you know, earlier in my life, about 20 years ago, I was in Bible college, and uh, one of the things that in Bible college, you, you live in these dorm rooms, and uh, it's anywhere from 12 guys in a room, uh, another section had, I think it was eight guys in a room, and then another section had about six guys in a room, and, and uh, I lived in, in two of these different sections during my time at Bible college, and one of them, my first semester at Bible college, my first, uh, first year, first semester being there, uh, I remember... I was, uh, I moved in and everything and there's, I'm living in this room with five other guys and we're trying to figure out in tight quarters, you know, bunk beds, all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're trying to, you know, think of like a tiny studio apartment with three bunk beds in it. It was, it was pretty crazy. And so we're living in these tight quarters and, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to, to serve you know, one another with time and space and patience, lots and lots of patience. And uh, I remember there was one, you know, as we were living there, there was one guy who was a little bit, a little bit different, uh, a little bit weird. And uh, which is, you know, probably pretty normal when you're trying to live with people. But uh, one of the things that he would do was he would move our stuff around the other guys. He would take some of our stuff and he would move it around the room. And uh, he would just put it in these weird, obscure spots, weird, obscure places. And as he did this, uh, if we didn't recognize that the stuff was moved, like t- say a pair of jeans, they, they got moved from you know, my area to up over here somewhere else. And uh, if I didn't recognize that it was moved, then he would then take them. He would, st- he would steal our stuff. And then, uh, you know, because he lived with us, it's not like he could just wear my jeans, right? I'm just, I'm going to know. And so what ended up happening is he would take it and then he would end up giving it to someone else on campus. So not only was he stealing, but then he was able to look really generous. You know, oh, hey, I just wanted to give this to you, this stuff to you. So people were, were getting our things uh, all, for, all throughout campus. And the way we found out that this was taking place was a friend of one of my roommates, the, the, the other guys, uh, he, you know, ended up getting my friend's stuff somehow and said, hey, isn't this yours? Didn't you say you were missing this? And we put it together that it was this guy uh, in our room. And, and it was really, really weird. It was one of those strange experiences. I had never really experienced anything like that before, and I really couldn't put it together until I realized that this was a manifestation of something that the Bible calls covetousness. And that's what we're going to be looking at together today in uh, commandment number 10, Exodus chapter 20, is the idea of covetousness, Exodus 20, 17. Now here's our big idea. As we look at the idea of covetousness and what this means and and what it looks like, it's this, that uh, discontentment is a deadly poison to the human soul. That's the idea of covetousness. It's this discontentment and it poisons the human soul. So let's look at Exodus chapter 20. We're going to read verse 17 together as we finish up our study in the Ten Commandments, and then we'll break it down together. It says this, Exodus 20, 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Lord, thank you for the chance to open your word and to study it together. And as we just consider you and how great you are, we consider the fact that you've written these Ten Commandments to us. We pray that you would help us to draw near to you. We pray that you would help us to understand you, to have your heart. We pray that you would uh, give to us deeper understanding of the spiritual truth that you are imparting to us. And Lord, we know that we can't understand this apart from you, that we need your help. Otherwise, we end up diving into religious exercises and and a bunch of fruitless stuff that really isn't what your heart is. And so, Lord, help us not only to understand the words, but to understand the heart behind the words and to know what it is that you're communicating to us. And so, Lord, we commit today to you. We thank you for it. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today, as we look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, this 10th commandment, uh, the final in our series in the Ten Commandments, we're going to break it down into two pieces. It's the source of covetousness and then the cure for covetousness. That's what we're going to take some time to look at. Now, of the Ten Commandments, 
only two of them are written in the positive. That, that means that eight of them are written from a negative standpoint, meaning don't do this, don't do that. 80% of the 10 commandments are written in such a way that God is saying, don't do that. And, and some people have trouble with that. They have an issue with that. They're not sure what to think about that. I, I remember hearing a comedian one time saying, you know, I, I tried reading the Bible once. I opened it up and it said, God said, don't. And so I closed it and I didn't. You know, it's like, haha, you're, you're funny, but not really. Uh, it's just this, this idea of trying to, to say there's so much don't in the Bible. I, I don't really, I just don't need that trip is kind of the idea that people are communicating with it, that there are so many things that are prohibited. And, and the question I want to ask is why? Why does God go through such great extent to give so much attention of the Ten Commandments? He's going to give 80% of time to saying, don't do this. Well, the reason I think is fairly simple. It's because the human heart is bent on wrong. It's bent on the stuff that we shouldn't do. This, that, that we've got to be told no. We've got to be told don't. Uh, anybody who's got kids knows that. Right? You, you have to spend so much of your time telling your toddler no, don't, stop, not that. And, and, and the reason why is because we are drawn to the stuff that we shouldn't be doing. Uh, it's, it's, it's this concept of depravity in the human soul being bent upon it. And the people who come from a perspective of, of humanists or evolutionists, they come from a slant of saying that people are basically good. And that if we just give people space, if we just give people time, if we just allow them to do whatever it is that they want, they're they're just going to pick the right thing. They're just going to be nice. They're just going to be kind. They're just going to be generous. They're just going to do the right thing. And, and God, in fact, is in direct opposition to this mentality. God, God takes a completely different approach and says, left to yourselves, you're going to plunge headlong into more and more filth, more and more depravity. You are going to be the one who ruins your own life, even more so if you're given that kind of a space. You see, humanists and evolutionists think that bad stuff happens because of things out there. God's word teaches that bad stuff happens because of the things in here, within the human heart. It's a problem of the stuff that's within, not with the stuff that's on the outside. It's not what happens to me, but it's what happens through me. That's the big issue. God's call for us is to abandon these things, and it's simultaneously a call to trust in him. That's what we've been looking at in the Ten Commandments. Every single time we come across these things, it's to say, it's to say that God's telling us, don't do this, but also, so trust me, hope in me, place your faith in me. And what this is not, it's not behavior modification. It's not that God's saying, here's a better way. If you just did it my way, then, then it would be better. And so try really hard, do better, and then you'll figure it all out. No, it, it's not that at all. Second Peter 2.22 says it like this. They prove the truth. The, the context of this is people who profess that they're, they have faith in Jesus, but then their lives don't really display that reality. He says, they prove uh, the truth of this proverb, a dog returns to its vomit, and another says, a washed pig returns to the mud. It's kind of this graphic imagery, isn't it? You know, a dog returning to its vomit. I don't know if you've had any dogs that have done that. It's not an exciting thing when dogs start eating stuff that they shouldn't be eating, uh, and you're wondering what in the world is going on. But I, I like the way that it says it in the second idea, a washed pig returns to the mud. Here's the idea. If you wash a pig, you, you take a pig, you wash it, you give it a bath, you know, you, you use some great shampoo on the thing and, and some body wash and, and then you put a dress on it and you're, you even put some makeup on it and spray some perfume on the pig. You know what's going to happen as soon as, you, as soon as you let the pig go outside? It's going to run right into the mud again. It's going to go right into the filth again. It's going to go right into the dirt again. Because even though you dress up a pig, it didn't change the nature of the pig. In order to get the pig to stop going into the mud, you have to fundamentally transform what it is. And that's the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel isn't do some better stuff. Try really hard. Maybe you could, maybe you could add this rule to your life. Maybe you could do those other things. No, it's, it's a fundamental transformation that who you are literally changes. That's the power of Jesus. That's the power of the blood of Christ shed on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's the message of the Lord. And so as we began with this idea, I want to conclude with this idea as well, with this thought that rules can feel restrictive. 
that when we start talking about Ten Commandments, we start talking about God's rules and God's way and God's law, it can feel like we're just being held down. Like these, these rules are these boundaries. It's like a chain that I'm, I'm linked to and I'm not allowed to really go into all the stuff that I want to do. But that's not really the truth of how rules work. That's not really the way that God's law is designed. You see, the, the law of God actually creates the structure for freedom that we need. It's not the thing that holds us back. It's the thing that sets us free. That's the reality. The, the Ten Commandments are a gracious gift from a loving dad. Think of it like this. It's like God is the, is the dad and he loves his kids so much that he puts up a fence around his yard so that the kids don't wander into the busy street and end up dead. That, that they don't get hit by the cars. You see, the dad doesn't put the fence up because he's mad at the kids. The dad doesn't put the fence up because he hates the kids, because he doesn't like the kids, because he, he wants to just impede upon their freedom. No, he puts the fence up because he wants the kids to be safe, to be protected, to not, to not run into the street and end up being injured or dead in, in a way that would be so terrible. And the freedom of the kids isn't the freedom to jump the fence and go play in the street. The freedom is to play within the yard and enjoy all that the Father has given to them. That's the idea of God's laws, of God's rules. It's not just him putting a trip on you or trying to keep you from fun stuff. No, when God says don't, he's saying don't hurt yourself and don't hurt others. Because when we violate God's law, that's what ends up happening. It only brings pain. It only brings destruction. And understanding the Ten Commandments as laws dis disconnected from the lawgiver, if we just see them as a set of rules, as, this, as these, these things etched into stone on these tablets, and we don't recognize that they're given by a good dad who loves and cares for his kids, then we misunderstand them completely. We bring, we bring this into a position of religious regulation instead of relationship with our dad, with a loving relationship. You see, we don't keep the law in order to get adopted into God's family. No, it's the other way around. We keep the law because we are adopted into God's family. Our ability to do it is, what produ is what's produced by our adoption. You see, our, our adoption into the family of God is what's the transformative work. It turns us into something new. That the, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, behold, Old things have passed away and all things have been made new. It's this idea of being born again that Jesus describes. And, and that's what we're looking at. You see, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says it like this. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not as, as a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Excuse me, here's the idea. The, the idea here is that Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 describes it as a flow of thought. That you're saved by works. You're like, wait, hold on. I, think you, I thought you just told me I wasn't saved by works. You're absolutely saved by works. Jesus' works, not your works. He worked on behalf of you. He kept the law completely. He totally satisfied all of the requirements of the law and laid down his life that you might be saved. You, you see, you're not saved by your works, but you are saved to works. That's what the rest of the verse says there in, in verse 10. That, that verse 8 tells us that we're not saved by our own works, that we're saved by the works of Jesus, and we are saved not just so that we don't do anything, not toward laziness, not toward our own thing, our own agenda, but God has prepared works for us to do, stuff for you to do. He has a plan for your life. He has things that he thought up before you were ever born, that he had stuff that he wanted you to accomplish. Here's the question. Are you doing it? Are you accomplishing it? Are you going after it? Or are you so wrapped up in your own life, in your own agenda, in your own things, in your own stuff, that you haven't even considered the fact that God has something for you, that God has things for you to do? You've been saved, not by your works, but you are saved to them. So let's look at these together as we count that as a backdrop for the Ten Commandments as a, as a whole. And now we look at this Tenth Commandment, this final commandment here in verse 17, and the first division uh, of our study together, the source of covetousness. Notice there it says in verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbors. And then we go into some different things. Here, here's the thing. Uh, to covet, covetousness is a word that means to pant after or to earnestly desire. 
<clears throat> it's an idea of an ungodly, discontented longing for that which is not supposed to be yours. N notice the qualification. Do not covet your neighbors. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to somebody else. It's theirs. And you have this longing, driving discontentment within your soul for something that is not yours. A discontented heart is something that poisons your soul with self-centered drive. It's that thing that says, I deserve, I need, I want, and I look at that and I say, I'm going to go and grab that with all that I have. Here's, here's the way that David Guzik describes it. He says, covetousness works like this. The eyes look upon the object, the mind admires it, the will goes over to it, and the body moves in to possess it. Just because you haven't taken the last step of covetousness, that, that step of moving in to possess it, I, don't think that the first steps are irrelevant. You see, it involves all of who you are. Covetousness infects your entire life. Your, your, your mind, your heart, your soul are bent on that which is not yours, and nor should it be yours. You see, covetousness willfully rejects what the Bible reveals about who God is what God does, what God values, and what God chooses. That's the issue of covetousness. Because God has chosen for you. God has given to you. God has placed things under your care, under your responsibility. The, the talents, gifts that you have, the kind of stuff that you have, all of it is a gracious gift from God. None of it's yours. None of it's you worked really hard and got it for yourself. Your hard work was a gift given to you by God. The fact that you're taking breath at this very moment is a gift given to you by God. And so when you look at life from that angle, from that perspective, when you understand that none of it's actually mine and everything, including my abilities to attain the stuff that I have has been given to me as a gift, then I look at the stuff that I have from a totally different perspective. But covetousness destroys all that. You see, it willfully rejects all of those things. And it says, I don't care who God is. I don't care what God values. I don't care what God has done. I don't get, care what God chooses. Instead, I'm going to believe the opposite. I'm going to believe that I'm in charge. I, I get this stuff for myself. It's the exact temptation that Satan brought to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Specifically to Eve. If you remember back to Genesis chapter 3, when Satan shows up, the serpent, the serpent shows up, he says to Eve that, uh, that you're not going to die if you eat from the tree. And, and he says, here's why. Because God knows that in the day that you eat from that tree, you're going to be like him, knowing good and evil. You see, what, what Satan's temptation was, is that God's not all good. He's hiding stuff from you. He's withholding good from you. And if you want it, you've got to go take it. That's the temptation. That's the heart. That's the thought. And that's the encapsulation of what covetousness is about. You see, Philippians 4.19 says it like this. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Here, Paul the Apostle is talking to the church in Philippi. That's what, where Philippians uh, comes from, the people of Philippi. And he says to them, I'm confident that God's going to take care of you the way that he has taken care of me. Paul's lived by faith. He's seen what God has done in his life and he's seen that God's provision has always come through. And he says, this isn't just something that's for me. It's not like there's this spiritual elite that somehow Paul's in a new category unto himself and that God takes care of that guy different than he's going to take care of everybody else. No, the truth is God looks at us equally. The, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. It's not that, you know, I'm a pastor, therefore I'm closer to God because I'm closer to the, to, to the cross or whatever. Uh, there's, there is no hierarchy within Christianity. It doesn't work that way. It's level. We all come to Jesus the exact same way. And so he says to us that God is the one who will supply your needs according to his glorious riches. The question is, do you actually believe that? Do you actually believe that that's who God is? Do you actually believe that that's what God does? Or do you reject that and say that's a lie and instead I've got to take care of me? I've got to be the one who takes responsibility for me. That's the issue of covetousness. You see, a covetous heart believes God will not provide. And, or it, it, it thinks this, God's provision isn't good. 
Either God's not going to provide for me or what he does provide, it's not good. It's not really the, it's not really what I want or that God's ways don't work. You know, if I do it God's way, if I'm honest the way God wants me to be honest, if I work hard the way God wants me to work hard, if I, uh, if I don't take advantage of the situation the way that God wants me to not do that, then it's not really going to work. I've got to work the system. I've got to manipulate. I've got to control. I've got to connive. I've got to insert some sort of sinful, self-centered depravity in order to get from life what I need. This, this is what covetousness does. You see, it says, I've got to take what I want. Here in this verse, in verse 17, we're given not only the idea of covetousness and that it's stuff that belongs to your neighbor, but we're also given four areas of life into which a covetous heart reaches. Four parts of life that we're given here. And notice the first one, it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. The idea of your neighbor's house, this is a general idea for anything that's under your responsibility or authority. So the idea of your house could mean your household, it could mean the actual dwelling that you live in, your car, your home, the furnishings within your house, the decor that's on the walls, uh, that kind of stuff, your family that lives within the house, your lawn, how awesome that is, uh, the neighborhood that you live in, the social standing that you have within society, maybe even your job. If maybe you own a company and you have different employees working for you or things like that, it's, it's to say, I want what they have. It's to say, I want their status. I want their standing. I want their stuff. I want that house. I want to live in that neighborhood. I want to, I want to take that for me. And so, so the Lord says, don't, don't covet that. Don't want their, their stuff. Or secondly, see the second category, you should not covet your neighbor's wife. Your neighbor's, your neighbor's spouse, and it's specific to wife in this because in this category of, of time in this era, uh, the men were the only ones who owned anything, and so it's specific to the men uh, in terms of, of wife, but uh, we can translate that to meaning uh, you know, a spouse. And what this is, this category is deeper than just wife, but it's, it's the idea of relationship enjoyment. It's the idea of saying, I want, I want her ability to have kids because in that time, in this day and age, when a woman had uh, children, that that's part of the way that she added value to the home, added value to the family. And it was a very, very big thing for women to, women to be able to have kids and not just kids, but lots of children. And uh, that's why when you see barrenness in the scriptures, it's this really devastating kind of a thing. And so maybe the, it's that idea or her beauty, you know, the, the status, uh, the symbol of status that she's this kind of beautiful. And so then I, I want that for me. I, I, I want to have that for me or maybe her cooking. You know, I, I know for me, if it was up to me to cook in our home, we'd all either die or be extremely unhealthy because my cooking ability is very limited. Uh, my kids still to this day, they laugh with one another and tell the story about how one day I was cooking and I was trying to make something awesome for them and I decided to add some vanilla extract to the eggs. Just so you know, that's a bad idea, okay? So men, don't do that. I've learned because I tried it and it was it was horrible, okay? Uh, I just, you know, I was watching cooking shows and they would just grab stuff and add it. And I'm like, hey, you know, we like vanilla and stuff. Let's try it in the eggs. It doesn't go together, okay? You're, you're, <laughs> you probably know that, but I didn't and I tried it and it was, it was terrible, right? And so, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, the guys are looking at, I wish, I wish, I wish I had that. I wish I had that woman, the way that, the way that she cooks or maybe the activities that she does and the way that they spend their time together. Or maybe, you know, you look at that marriage and you go, I wish, I wish I had that marriage. I wish I had that going on. Third area of this category is, notice it says you shall not covet uh, your, wife, your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant or his female servant. The idea of servants has to do with financial status. Um, think of it less like slavery and that kind of thing. We already addressed that before, the idea of, of slavery and, and how, um, you know, when we're talking about this concept, you can't think of it in terms of American slavery. That atrocity and, and uh, the horrific uh, terrible aspects of that are not what is happening here in, in biblical slavery. The Bible categorically condemns 
what, uh, what happened in American slavery. Uh, the, the idea of um, kidnapping people and, and forcing them into servitude and seeing them as less uh, people, that is, not, that is not what the Bible describes of in terms of slavery. Think of slavery more in line with the idea of uh, employment. You know, um, it's not directly equated, but it's, it's much more closer uh, to that. And so maybe, you know, you think of this in terms of financial status. Maybe, maybe they have a nanny. Or maybe they have a house cleaner. Or maybe they have a landscaper. Someone, you know, they don't even mow their lawn. They don't even shovel their driveway. I've got this north-facing driveway and I can't believe how much snow falls on the stupid thing. And I just, I just want light to light it on fire. You know, whatever it is. Uh, maybe they got a personal assistant. Or, or maybe you look at their spending habits and you're like, look at how much money they just spent. They don't even worry about their bank account. They just swipe the card and they keep swiping it. And man, that would be so nice. It would be so amazing. Or you see the way they dress, the clothing that they wear or you see that the recreation that they have and you see their financial position and you go, I want their spot. I want what they have. Or fourthly, in, uh, in this fourth category, their ox or donkey. Now, this one might be difficult for you because you're probably not thinking, man, my neighbor's got such a sweet ox. I wish I had that thing. Um, I'm, I'm going to guess your neighbor probably doesn't even have an ox. So you're like, okay, I'm good. I, I don't even have to worry about this one. No, I think this one speaks to the idea of luxury possessions. Th think of uh, an agrarian culture in this time, in this day and age. People who had things like oxes and donkeys, these were, these were workhorses. Uh, it's sort of a pun, I guess. Uh, th these were things that made, things, made life much easier, made life much better in terms of the amount that they could perform and the stuff that they could do. May maybe they don't have an ox, but what do they have? What about their Tesla? Maybe, maybe you look at their car and you're like, man, I wish I had that car. Or maybe the kinds of vacations they go on, the spots they go to, or maybe their second home on their vacation spot. Maybe you look at their position. You know, oh gosh, if I just was able to, to get to that position within the company, that position in life, that kind of influence, that kind of status, that kind of, of thing. Well, if I just had their opportunities, you know, life's just handed me some bad cards. I just don't have the right opportunities. And if I just, if I had their opportunities, then oh, what, what we're doing when we say these things is, is we're coveting. You see, Covetousness is one of those things that, that goes into so many areas of life that we don't, really, we don't really grasp the gravity of it. And just in case we somehow escape those, if somehow I described all of those and you thought, well, check, I'm good. I, I've, I've escaped the, uh, you know, the one that's talking about the house, the wife, the servants, and the ox and donkey. Well, just in case you didn't notice, there's a, a, a final one. There's a fifth category. Nor anything that is your neighbor's. Right, so God just throws that out there and just basically says, if I, in case I didn't hit your exact thing, well, anything else that you're thinking about, that counts too. Whatever that thing is, whatever that, that tendency in your heart is to say, they have it and I want to take it away. That, that I want to not only, not only have it, but I want them to not have it. That that's the idea of covetousness. Here's the thing. Covetous is, covetousness, that word is hard to say. It's not, hey, those are nice shoes. Where'd you get them? I'd like to get a pair too. That, that's not covetousness. The idea of covetousness is, hey, those are nice shoes. Take them off because I want them. That's the idea of covetousness. It's to say, I want to take what's yours and, and it doesn't belong to me, but I want to make it mine. That's the idea of covetousness. So, so it's not necessarily saying I want, you know, the, I, I want to have a thing. Uh, that can be a, a driving desire that feeds covetousness though, but it's not necessarily the idea of saying that you want to have something. Now, this, this 10th commandment, it's really unique. Uh, of all the commandments that we've looked at, of the, the previous nine, all of them are angled from the, the idea of an external thing first. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a doing first. It's what you do primarily. It's a, it's a, an external thing dealing with your actions. While this tenth commandment is primarily dealing with internal desire. You notice that you shall not covet. And then it goes through all these different things. It's the idea of what's happening within your heart. It's the stuff that's going on inside your mind. It's what's taking place within you. Not even the stuff that you do on the outside before you ever take action to actually take it, it's saying, what's that desire within you? What's taking place within you? Here's how uh, Alexander McLaren talks about it in his uh, commentary. 
Uh, exposition of Holy Scripture on uh, volume one, page 113. It says this, but deed and word will not be right unless the heart be right. And the heart will be wrong unless it is purged, unless it be purged of the bitter black drop of covetousness. The desire to make my neighbor's goods mine is the parent of all breaches of neighborly duty. Even as it's converse, love is the fulfilling of it all. For such desire implies that I am ruled by selfishness and that I would willingly deprive another of goods for my own gratification. That's the issue of covetousness. That I would willingly take from you in order to give to me. You see, this idea is unprecedented in all uh, religious moral codes and human laws. Nothing dares to step into the realm of regulating human desire. Think of it like this. What if the House and the Senate decided to start making laws based on what you could want? How exactly are they going to regulate that? You can desire this, but you can't desire that. And these are good desires and those are bad desires. But God steps directly into this realm. He says, I want to rule not just your actions, but the heart behind the actions. Turn in your Bible to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Um, we're not going to read the entire psalm, but I do want to read a, a big chunk of it with you together because I think the way that it describes it is really awesome. Uh, the book of Psalms is right in the very middle of your Bible. That's the easiest way to find it. Uh, typically, if you open to the very center, you'll find Psalms. Um, Proverbs is after, Job is before. Uh, psalm 139 is where I want to look with you uh, together. And I think that this psalm describes a, a really um, uh, specific idea surrounding God and his desire for our heart. It says, Psalm 139, I want to read verses 1 through 12, and then skip to the end of the psalm and read the last two verses. It says this in Psalm 139, 1, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Verse seven, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. And if, my, if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide me from you, but the night shines as the day and the darkness and the light are both alike to you. It's crazy what, what this says here, that God knows your thoughts. God knows your motives. Before you form the word, God knows it. He, com he knows all of it. He knows everything about it, that there's nothing, there's no thought that you think, there's no uh, feeling you have, there's nothing secretive that nobody else knows. All that stuff that you hope is never uncovered. If we were to play a movie of your life in front of everybody, and, and that stuff that you're thinking, I hope that that does it, I hope that makes the, the, the editor's cut, and it goes onto the, the cutting room floor, and it doesn't get displayed. Those things God knows intimately and completely. There's nothing hidden from him at all. And there's this imagery of, if I try to go to heaven, you're there. If I go to the grave, you're there. If I, go, if I try to go to the furthest spot on the planet where nobody is, you're still there. That God still remains there. He sees it all. He knows it all. But look at what verse 23 says as, as we look at the end of this psalm. It says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, this is, a, this is a dangerous prayer to pray. This isn't just one of those things that, that flippantly comes out of the mouth of David that says, you know, see if there's any wicked way in me. This is a dangerous prayer because it assumes there is wickedness within me. And, and I am so depraved and so, uh, so broken within my own heart and, and spirit that I can't even detect how fallen I am. I can't even detect the wickedness that's within me. God, I need you to show it to me. If you'll pray that prayer, I guarantee God will start showing it to you. 
He'll start showing you things within you that you, you didn't even know were there. You lied to yourself. You covered it up to yourself. You justified it. You made reasons why it was okay. And yet it's completely offensive to God and he hates it. And if you'll pray that, not only will God show it to you, but he'll lead you in the way everlasting. He'll bring you to the end of yourself where you find Jesus, where he alone can bring the healing to your soul that you need. You see, the 10th commandment goes after your heart. It goes after your desire. Let me ask it to you this way. If you could have anyone's stuff, anyone's house, anyone's car, anyone's business, anyone's position, anyone's status, anyone's body, anyone's spouse, if you could have anyone's, whose who's would it be? If anything came into your mind as I asked you that question, that's covetousness. If you want theirs, that's covetousness. Here, here's another way to ask it. Who are you jealous of? Where does jealousy come into your heart? Who are you jealous of? If there's anybody that's on your heart and mind, and I'm, if you're saying there's nobody, then maybe you should pray about it a little bit because I, I think there's probably some stuff that needs to be revealed in your heart. I mean, maybe you should pray this prayer that, that uh, is at the end of Psalm 139. Because the truth is that that's bound up within the heart of every person. And we've got to be willing to bring that to the Lord and understand that it's, it's an unwillingness to trust him. It's an unwillingness to put our faith in him. All right, so secondly, not only the source of covetousness, but the cure for covetousness. What do we do with this thing? This is so prevalent. It's so deep. It's so, it's so pervasive. It's found its way so deep into my heart and my soul and, and the, the inner workings of my life. And, you know, the, the uh, advertisement company has really figured out how to tap into this. And so they use this against me all day, every day, so that I want that thing. You know, it's like when you're, when you're watching... Uh, you know, uh, TV and a commercial comes up for pizza and uh, all you're thinking is, I have to have pizza like right now. I, that I will not be satisfied unless the cheesy goodness and glory is in my mouth and filling my stomach. That is them targeting your covetousness. That they're, they're provoking that thing within you that says, I need something. I need this. It's, it's far more prevalent than we might think. And every human heart is perpetually stuck on covetousness. So I want to give you a, two different killers of covetousness. Here are two covetousness killers that we can look at together today. Number one is desire. Desire. Now, that might strike you as weird because when you think about that, aren't we talking about desire and the problem is desire? Isn't that the issue that I'm, I'm wanting and desiring? And isn't that the issue that I want too much? You see, we've been targeting this word from the negative, but the, the word covetousness is actually a fairly neutral word. Maybe you're familiar with the psalm that says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. It's the same idea. It's the same concept. It's the same longing desire. That, that it's not that our desire is, uh, is, is too deep. It's not deep desire that's the issue. It's wrong desire that's the issue. C.S. Lewis in his book, Weight, The Weight of Glory on page 26 says it like this. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promise of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desire not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. The issue isn't desire. The issue is the wrong desire. We are far too easily pleased with the things that will never satisfy us. The stuff that will only leave us empty. The things that, that seem satisfying for a fleeting moment, but actually bring destruction with them. If instead we would lift our eyes from all of this temporary stuff that's in front of us that grasps for our attention and, and see heaven, see eternity, see Jesus for who he really is, and in him find our, our satisfaction. Oh, then, then things would change for sure. You see, there are many things to which we can give our full measure of perpetually growing desire, and it's never going to be wrong. It'll never be a bad thing. Here's how Galatians 5 talks about it. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Listen to this last part because most people, when they hear this verse, that's the part that they think about. Listen to this. There is no law against these things. Here's what this is saying. You can take any of these things, any of these fruit of the spirit, if you want to call it that way, or these attributes, these virtues, and you can take them to the absolute extreme and they're still good. Think, think of it like this. If you take love to its furthest extent, are you going to go to prison? You're just too loving, bro. We got to lock you up. Like, what? That's just not going to happen. You're so kind and so patient. I just, I just can't deal with it anymore. We've got to put you in prison. You're a danger to society. Like that, there's no such thing against, uh, as a law against these kinds of things. Your self-control isn't going to be so extreme that you're somehow a danger to people around you. You see, these are things that you can dive into to an extreme extent that will never, never be bad things. You can desire these with all that you are and pursue them with your whole heart for your whole life. Pursuing loving your family and, and, and knowing your wife and, and loving her intimately and deeply and raising your kids in a godly way and, and knowing Jesus and reading his word. You can dive so deeply into those things and, and have this longing, panting desire. And it's never bad. It's never a wrong thing. Desire is the first contentment kill, or excuse me, uh, the, the first covetousness killer. And number two, contentment is the second one. I kind of let that one out early, right? <laughs> I was building the suspense and I messed it up. Contentment is the second one. Not only desire, but secondly, contentment. They're sort of opposing concepts, aren't they? Desire and contentment. Isn't contentment the opposite of desire? Well, well sort of, but here's the idea. The amount or type of stuff that you have or don't have isn't the issue. That's not the issue with contentment. It's not the, 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 st the stack and, the, and how high the pile is. It's not the type of things you had. You know, if I just had, I have a car, but if I just had a nicer car. That, that's not the issue of contentment because when you get a nicer one, it's just gonna be, it'll be old one day and you'll need a new one. You see, the idea of contentment is a willful satisfaction in what God has chosen to provide. Will you willfully, volitionally, that, that your will is engaged to say, I'm satisfied with what God has chosen to provide for me. You see, contentment isn't found in having more. It's not found in having different. And it's not found in having a change of circumstances. You're never going to find contentment in those things. Circumstances will change, you won't be content. You get more stuff, you still won't be content. You, you, you have a different thing. I, I had this one. You know, it's like all of you PC users, if you buy an Apple, you're probably going to be content. No, you're probably not, right? You're just going to be dissatisfied with it uh, eventually because you can't find contentment in different or newer or bigger and better or having more. You see, it's not what's in your hand that's the issue. It's what's in your heart. Very similarly to what we were talking about with the issue of murder. Murder has very little to do with what's in your hand. It has everything to do with what's in your heart. So too it is with contentment. Philippians 4, 12 through 13 says it like this. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. Here, he's, he's giving us the secret. How do we do this? How do we have a life that, that is satisfied with so much that I, I have an extra, a lot of extra or so little that I, I'm worried about surviving? How do, I, how do I live in both states equally the same? He says this, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength, or I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, if you know it that way. Now, this verse, Philippians 4.13, has nothing to do with winning sporting events, right? Did you see the context there? It has nothing to do with, we're going to go out and we're going to crush the, the bad guys because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with contentment. Contentment has nothing to do with the amount of stuff you have or the different stuff you have or the changing of circumstances. It has everything to do with where your faith is placed. Is your hope in Jesus? Is Christ Jesus where your strength is found? That, that's the secret to success. That's the secret to contentment is Jesus himself. He's not a religious concept, but someone who, who very carefully filters everything that comes into your life. Did you know that? 
He very carefully filters everything that comes into your life by his love, that you can trust in him and be strengthened in him. Now, there might be things that come into your life that you don't like, that you would never have chosen, that you wouldn't, you wouldn't pursue on your own. They, they can be very difficult, very hard things. But if you understand them as coming through the loving filter of our great God and Savior, then you realize that they're not for your destruction, but for your good. They're for his glory. And he's even able to take bad things and to use them for good. That's how great and amazing Jesus is. George Rawlinson in his uh, commentary, the public commentary, volume three, page 161 says it like this. Love is that divine affection which alone is the power to expel all selfishness. Love alone can purify the heart, guard the thoughts, and discipline the desires. Experiencing the love of Jesus is far more than a nice feeling. That's not what we're talking about. It's not, it's not this nice feeling. It's a supernaturally transforming power. That's the love of Jesus. It's, it's, it's something that dives deep into the human heart and literally changes who we are. That's the love of Jesus. You see, self is overcome by experiencing the love of God. And then once that takes place, you can then give out the love of God as well. It's experiencing more of Jesus. You see, we can all learn a certain amount of behavior modification. We can try to make ourselves better. We can try to do more, do, you know, do more stuff and try to, to hold back the gates of, of depravity. We can even make it seem like we're good. But the heart of the matter is, it's actually a matter of the heart. Proverbs 4.23 says this, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Your heart determines the course of your life. All the stuff that's taking place in your life right now has nothing to do with a virus. It has nothing to do with, with what's taking place in our world. Your life isn't what happens to you. Your life is what you decide to do with it. And if your heart is wrong, if your heart is off, if your heart isn't in a position of faith, then what's going to come out of you is faithlessness. But if your heart is in a position of trusting in the Lord, of hoping in Him, of understanding that He's in control, then what's going to come out of you is faithfulness. It's an issue of, of the heart. You see, behavior modification, it's just dressing up the dead corpse of your flesh, putting, putting on clothes and spraying a perfume and hoping that nobody recognizes that you're actually dead. That's all religious behavior modification is. But when you come to Jesus, he does something radically different. Turn your Bibles. I want to conclude here. We're going to stop here. I just want to read a couple of verses. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. As we finish up our series in the Ten Commandments and bring it to a close, I think it would be fitting for us to, to see how Jesus addresses the idea of being made alive and what he has to say about it. And I think it's an important thing that we can grasp from him. Look at verse three. John chapter three, verse three says this. Jesus answered and said to him, he's talking to this guy, Nicodemus, who's a spiritual leader in that time in Jerusalem. And he comes to Jesus with some questions. And Jesus says to him, verse three, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus has some questions about that. Verse four, uh, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Like he's trying to process this. What? Are you talking about Jesus? I'm bigger than my mom. This isn't going to work, right? He's trying to figure it out. Jesus answered, verse 5, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, right? Physical birth. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. There needs to be a spiritual birth. Verse 7, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but can't tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. It's this, it's this thing that you can't really grasp or understand or put words on all the time because it's a supernatural thing that's taking place. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher in Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you uh, do not receive our witness. Here in these verse, first 11 ver verses, Jesus is essentially saying there is no access to God apart from being born again. 
And verse six qualifies that by saying it's being made spiritually alive. That when you were born, you were born spiritually dead. Every human since our first parents, Adam and Eve, have been born spiritually dead. And the only way to gain access to God the only way for a hope of heaven, the only way for a hope of a transformed life here on earth is to be made spiritually alive. That, that, that you're not going from, from okay to better. You're not going from bad to good. You're going from dead to alive. You're going from dark to light. That's what Jesus is talking about. Look at verse 12. He says this. Jesus continues. If I had told you earthly things... We, uh, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down, he's speaking of himself, from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. Here Jesus is pointing to his death on the cross. That spiritual life is made possible because Jesus has entered into human history and chosen to sacrifice himself for all of us. That that's the way spiritual life happens. It's through his death. That Jesus dies in our place. And that is what allows us to be made alive. Well, how does this work? How does it all take place? Well, Jesus answers the question. Look at verse 15. That, Jesus continues, whoever believes in him, speaking of himself, believes in Jesus, should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his, uh, send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. What Jesus is saying here is that we are born dead in darkness. And if we love that darkness, we're not going to love the light. The light's going to be an assault to us, an affront to us. It's going to reveal the depravity. It's going to reveal the darkness of our souls. And if instead of trying to cover up that filthiness, we, we are willing to come to Jesus with it, he's willing to change us and transform us. Five times in these five verses that we just read there at the end, Jesus addresses the issue of belief. Belief is the issue. How do you get it? How does this transformation happen? How does it take place? Jesus says, if you'll believe in me. Not, not me, Cody, but Jesus is speaking. If you'll believe in him. If you'll believe that he stepped into human history. If you'll believe that he went to the cross, not because of the mean Romans, not because the Jews betrayed him, not because he just got overpowered and had a bad day, not because he just, you know, he had to die some way, I guess. No, Jesus willingly went to the cross. He said to Peter, uh, no one's taking my life from me. I lay it down of my own free will. That you believe that Jesus dies on the cross. His blood is spilled to pay the price for your sin. And then Jesus resurrects from the dead. Three days later, raises from the dead. That's why we're celebrating Easter next Sunday. Because on Friday, Jesus dies, and on Sunday, Jesus is alive. The only one in human history to ever come back from the dead on his own. Jesus raised some people from the dead, but nobody did what he did. And that proves his deity. That proves he is who he is. That he can purchase your soul from sin and death if you'll just believe in him. That's really all it takes. The Bible tells us in Romans that you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. And that's all that, that's all that it takes to enter into the family of God or to be made right with, with the Lord, to be made right with God. Believing in your heart that Jesus is the one who, who paid the penalty for your sin and then confessing with your mouth that he's the one who has done this. That's, that's really all it is. And you can pray a simple prayer. Asking Jesus to be the one who saves you. Asking Jesus to be the one who adopts you into his family. You just simply acknowledge to him that you've sinned and you ask him to forgive you of that sin and you ask for him to be your God, to be your king. That's really all it is. There's no magic words. You don't even need me to lead you in a prayer. You can do it right from where you're at as, as you, your heart cries out to God and you'll experience salvation. You'll, you'll, you'll experience what it is for the Holy Spirit to move into you and to give you a new heart to wash your mind in the water of God's word and to be led forward in your life. And so I wanna, I wanna just not only offer that extension to you, but 
but to say that Jesus is the only way that you can go from being dead to being alive. It's not any, no amount of you trying really hard, no amount of, of you trying to change your behavior is gonna do this. No, you need something supernatural to do, to do that for you, and it's the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the chance to study it together. We pray that you would help us, Lord, to apply it to our hearts and minds, to our lives, and that you'd be glorified. Jesus, we thank you for taking the time to teach us out of John chapter three and just to reveal to us that you are the way. You're the truth. You're the life. You're the one who has sacrificed yourself that we might become born again. And so God, we thank you for your great love and we thank you for the way you take care of us. We pray together in Jesus' name, amen.